we need to be at a different level for what he has for us in the future. So I got some vision behind that. I got some hope behind that. I hope you hear that this morning. So there's this expectation that we make progress and that the more we know God, the more we live for God and serve him, the more we look like Jesus. Amen? We're called Christians. We're Jesus-isms. Uh, that one doesn't roll off the tongue quite as nice. But So as a church, again, I feel like, like God is calling us to grow up. Now, I'm not trying to condemn all of you. I'm speaking this to myself as well. But what I believe that God has in store for us and what he wants to do in us, in each of us, and in this community is something that we're going to need some maturity for so that we can handle it well. Amen? So I would consider it like a promotion. How about we view this as a promotion? God wants to promote us to new levels of faith, to be seeing more people set free and finding God's purpose for their life. And again, we can't get to where we're going if we stay where we've been. So to help us with that, today we're going to be looking at our source. And what I want to do to help us get there is talk about one of my favorite things in the whole world, and that is water. I love water. I got two water bottles up here today. Hopefully that'll get me through. But I just, I love drinking water. I love swimming. I love being in a boat. I love being by the water. I love everything about water. There's just something about the water. Is there anybody else that's with me on the whole boat and water thing? Yeah. So something about the water. One of my favorite things to do, probably my, my only real hobby is fishing. I love fishing. My buddy Josh and I, and we go out at the, the, just the earliest hour of dawn, and we get in a canoe, and we just slip out there on those misty mornings, and it restores my soul. It's like the Lord has led me by the quiet waters right out of Psalm 23, and I go out there. I like taking hikes. A lot of the hiking trails in this area, they're by rivers, they're by streams, and you can just go for a walk, talk to the creator who made said river and streams, and just, it just stirs my soul. Uh, my wife gets a kick out of this, either that or she gets a little annoyed by it. Whenever we pass a body of water, I'm like, it beckons. <laughs> and we live in Shell Lake, and we can see Shell Lake out of our kitchen window. We're on the other side of 63, but we can look out the window and look right down the airport and look over, and we see Shell Lake, and it's beautiful, and it's glistening. Of course, we have the earliest ice out in recorded history, so I get all that blue, sparkly water. And so I was looking up some facts about water, not just about my infatuation with it. You know that the earth, 71% of the surface of the earth is water. Over 60% of your body is made up of water. Most of it's in your organs, 80% of the brain, 75% of your heart, and 75% of your lungs is water. Now listen to this. The average person can survive three weeks without eating anything. I'm about three hours, but anyways... Um, <laughs> I'm not an average Joe. So the average person can survive only three days without drinking anything. So personally, I'm a bit of a heavy drinker um, when it comes to water. Sorry. <laughs> Recovery community, i got to watch what I'm doing here. Um, but I seriously, I, 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 and if you go in my office here at the church, you'll see I have a 30-ounce tumbler, and I keep it here because if I move them around, I lose them. So I have one here at the church. I work over at Paragon. So on my desk at Paragon is a 32-ounce tumbler. And I have one at home. And again, the strategy, maybe this will really help somebody today, is you just get one for each of the places you frequently go to and you leave it there so that you're not trying to transport it and you lose it. So I just saved somebody 50 bucks. If you want to put that towards offering, we will accept that. <laughs> so I drink, I probably drink about a gallon a day. Is there any gallon a day water club folks? You know what I'm talking about. What is the trade off? Every 20 minutes, you're going to the restroom. Yes. So you got to balance out your life and whether or not you can join the gallon a day club. Uh, but it, water, water is what keeps me going. Whenever my kids have like, oh, dad, my throat hurts, or dad, my head hurts, or dad, my stomach doesn't feel good, the first thing, and they're going to like, if they were in here, they would say, go drink some water. That's what I'm going to tell them. It's like when people used to say, go sit on the pot. Now I say, just go drink some water and then come back in 10 minutes and let me know how you're doing. Number one cause of death of houseplants. You know where I'm going with this. Improper watering or just total lack thereof. Um, and then so when NASA, there's another water fact, when NASA sent Rover to Mars, one of the key things they were looking for was water because water sustains life. So today we're going to be looking in the Bible. We're going to be looking at some water sources in the Bible. We're going to be going back to our old friend Jeremiah, and we're going to be looking at some water sources today. So remember Jeremiah. We talked about him earlier in March. Jeremiah was sent by God to be his messenger 
to the southern kingdom of Judah. It's around 600 B.C., so 600 years before Christ. Jeremiah, he's known as the weeping prophet. We had some empathy for this guy because his assignment was to tell the people of Judah that their backsliding and forgetting God was going to bring judgment and that it would come through their enemies eventually revealed to be the Babylonians. So Jeremiah was not a popular fellow. The people of Judah, they refused to listen to Jeremiah, and they kept on going in their sin. They just would not repent. That's that Bible word that means to turn from your wicked way and to turn to God. So God followed through on what he had been telling them that he would do, and the people of Judah, they were captured, and they were taken into exile, and their capital city of Jerusalem was destroyed along with Solomon's temple. So we're going to go back to an early part of Jeremiah today. We know this context now. This, uh, this is Jeremiah. He's probably writing during the reign of King Josiah. Babylon hasn't come yet, but he's, he's giving the warnings. And so this is one of the warnings, one of the images that God used. Now let's set this up with Jeremiah 2, and we'll look through verses 1 through 3. It says, the Lord gave me another message. He said, go and shout this message to Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I remember how eager you were to please me as a young bride long ago. How you loved me and followed me even through the barren wilderness. In those days, Israel was holy to the Lord, the first of his children. All who harmed his people were declared guilty and disaster fell on them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, before we get to the water source here, let's just stop for a second. And God tells Jeremiah, shout this message to Jerusalem. And he's setting up a contrast. The message was, God remembers. God remembers how it began, how it started with Israel as a nation. And God, he was excited. It's like this this picture of this groom. He's wooing his bride to come to a quiet place where they could be alone and get to know each other. And of course, this is referring back to God leading the people out of Egypt and into the wilderness. Here, for the first time, he was interacting with his chosen people. And because they were the people of his choosing, he was going to show them how to live in order to host his presence. And then he calls them out. If, I'm going to skip a few verses, but your assignment would be to read 4 through 11. He says, what happened? What did your ancestors find wrong with me? Where do you come off forgetting me? And he just lays it into him. And so I'm hopping down now into verse 12 and verse 13. And God applies this contrast. He says in verse 12, The heavens are shocked at such a thing and shrink back in horror and dismay, says the Lord. For my people have done two evil things. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. He says all of heaven can't believe what they're seeing. They shrink back in horror and dismay. It's like all of heaven is saying, are you kidding me? Who does this? And then like a lawyer in court, God lays out their crimes. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. So they have departed from God. They have forsaken God. And then Not only that, they have dug for themselves cracked cisterns that can hold no water at all. Now, this is a word picture that God is giving them in this very stern message, and it would have been immediately recognized by the people. We live in the land of 15,000 lakes. We have water everywhere. In the nation of Israel, that is not the case. It's a very dry land, and it depends heavily on seasonal rains that would come in. For instance, in the springtime, And then the rest of the year, it's dry. So when it's raining and the rains are coming, what they would do to help sustain life is they would hew out these big cisterns in the rock. It's like this big underground cave sort of thing, almost like a well, but just like a big tank. And they'd have a cap on the top and a narrower top. And some of them, they were quite large. I've heard of cisterns up to an acre in size. And they would line the inside of the cistern with masonry and with cement so that it's watertight. So when the rain came, it would be designed so that the water could catch into the cisterns, and then it would collect in the cistern. And because it was underground and because it was covered, it would stay cool, and it wouldn't evaporate, and it wouldn't leak out. And so the people would actually be able to draw from the cistern throughout the whole dry season and make it until the next rainy season. You were considered really blessed, very blessed if your territory had a well that tapped into the water table, or if you had a spring of water coming up, 
That was just provision from heaven. That was fantastic. And so this is imagery. Are we seeing the imagery this morning that God is trying to set up for them to say through this prophet Jeremiah, he's trying to get the people to see the sin that they had, had committed and to, to be able to see what it is that they need to repent of and why he's calling them to return to believing in God. And it's an interesting thing. God here is comparing himself to a fountain of living water. That's best case scenario in the dry and arid land, a fountain. It's just right up on the surface. You just dip your cup in and you take a sip. If it's a well, you got to let the bucket down, and then it's deep, so you go for a ways, and you got to draw it back up, and then you can get your sip. you got to work for it. All these other ways you have to work for it. But Jesus, or God says here, I am the fountain of living water. Again, best case scenario. The Hebrew word is really fun. It's mayim hayim. Go ahead and try it. Mayim Hayim, living waters. He is the fountain of Mayim Hayim. And so this is this idea, these living waters. This is the life-giving source. It's readily available. He showed them how to maintain access to him. But they abandon that. They abandon that. And aren't you like me a little bit like now? You're kind of joining the heavens. You're like, where do you get off abandoning that? Other translations say they've forsaken God. They have forsaken God. Not only that, but they also pursued other gods, these false gods. This is idolatry, and that is just a cracked cistern. Once it's cracked, you can't fix it. The, the earth is cracked. The water goes. You put water into it, and it just leaks out. It's literally a useless mud puddle in the ground. And God says, how appalling is this? Not only did they forsake me, but they abandoned me and pursued false gods, idols. So it's a double whammy. It's two sins. Their worship is not to God, and it is to something else. Now, this is getting to a strong term. There's a strong term that's used for that forsaken, and it's apostasy. We don't like talking about that word because it's really, really quite firm. But it means to renounce the faith and to continue to walk away. It's not just getting angry at God one time. It's like making that public declaration that I'm done with you, God, and I'm going to go live for myself. I'm going to go live for idolatry. So again, it's not just being numb to the faith. That's like apathy or indifference. It's this deliberate decision. I'm going to abandon my faith in Yahweh, the one true God, and instead I'm going to put it into something worthless. Worthless underground mud puddles with no value. we're talking about Jeremiah, we know how this pans out for the people of Judah. They never take the opportunity to repent. They never take the opportunity to return to God. God follows through. The next step in that covenant promise is that they're taken into exile for a period of 70 years, and then a remnant returns. And so when we look at this, we look at this apostasy. There's no way around it. We got to call it what it is in the Old Testament here. This is apostasy. They have the fountain of living water right there. And they walk away from it and instead chose the broken cisterns of idolatry. And again, it can be easy for us to be like, those guys are the worst. Like, who does that? My question for you this morning is, what can we learn from Israel's apostasy? I'm glad you asked. So when we look at the Old Testament One thing we got to remember is that there's key points of understanding in the Bible and in the theology or the understanding of God that's in the Scriptures that's in development in the Old Testament. It's not that we get the New Testament and we throw out the Old Testament. Some things, like God's character, he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That doesn't change. You read about God in the Old Testament, same God. There's other things, like the creation story or like narratives and world history, Those things happened, and that's part of the story. So the Old Testament is very rich, but there are things like salvation and law versus grace. These are things that are in development throughout the Old Testament, and then they come to their full force in the New Testament. This will make sense in a minute. Think of salvation in the Old Testament like a caterpillar. You can try all you want, but you cannot make a caterpillar fly. Salvation in the Old Testament was like a caterpillar compared to a butterfly. Now, Jesus takes the caterpillar understanding 
quite literally, and he embodies, he becomes the caterpillar. Are you seeing it this morning? God incarnate, Jesus becomes the salvation plan, and he becomes the next phase of development. What does he do? He spends three days in a cocoon, right? You with me? Just celebrated Easter. He comes out of Joseph's tomb, and out comes the butterfly. Now we're like, this is what this has been building up towards. This is the full picture of what God was doing with salvation through the Old Testament. So in the Old Testament, part of this developing understanding was seeing God as the source of life. And you can go all the way back. It starts with God as the creator. And if you follow this theme of living water, you see the understanding is starting to develop. In the beginning, God creates a spring in the garden, right? Remember that? From this spring in the Garden of Eden flows rivers, mighty rivers that flow, and they flow into a geographical region in real life that we call the Fertile Crescent, which is the origin of human history. Isn't that something? God begins this theme, and he helps us see in this natural world around us that he is the source of this living water. And then you look into the psalmist, and the psalmist says that the fear of the Lord is like a fountain of living water. Here in Jeremiah, God himself is said to be the fountain of living water. So where do you think this is going in the New Testament? Jesus, right? It's, the Sunday school answers are correct. So to help see this in full development, we're going to leave Jeremiah now. We're going to fast forward 628 years to the life of Jesus Christ, we're going to take a look at an interaction between Jesus and a woman by a water source. You probably know where I'm going with this. This is John chapter 4. It's a wonderful story. Because it's such a good story, I don't want to miss any of the details. We're going to hunker down and do all 26 verses. Are you with me this morning? So starting in John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. That'd be John the Baptist. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and he returned to Galilee. So this would be Judea, would be like the southern kingdom of Jeremiah's time, went back up north. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the village that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at that time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, And who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, (laughs) you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? Besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Verse 15, please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you are living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here on Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming. When it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming. Indeed, it is here now. 
when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Mic drop. So here's this interaction. There's a lot going on here. And you know what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to connect all the dots. So let's go. Jesus is explaining here. It's a new level of understanding of how God's people are going to interact with him. Rather than the fountain of living water being something that we fail to maintain access to, instead, the fountain is going right inside of us. And it'll flow out of us, and it will keep bubbling up, bubbling us up right to eternal life. I want to highlight this incredible progression in the story. Jesus goes, in the beginning, he's this weary traveler. In the end, he's the promised Messiah. And the woman, she goes from guarded, and she's kind of punchy, to dropping everything to go tell the whole town that the Messiah has come. So first, the story starts out with some clues. It points to the humanity of Jesus. He's traveling by foot. It's noon. The sun is high in the sky. He is tired. I imagine his feet were sore. Maybe he's a bit sweaty. Maybe Jesus has some body odor going on. Everyone's like, can we say that about Jesus? <laughs> this is Jesus, and I want to show you that Jesus, his humanity is on display here. And I don't mean in any way to discredit his divinity. I don't mean to slander you, Jesus, at all today. It's just helpful for us to remember that when God sent his son, Jesus, to the earth, he got the full human experience. Source text. Verse 6. Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well. So at this point in Jesus' ministry... He had gotten into some scrutiny in Jerusalem. It was getting too much attention for this point of time in his ministry, so he decides he's going to go back up north to Galilee. And what's interesting about this is that he decides to go through Samaria. So there's a lot that can be said about Samaria. I'm sure you've heard a lot of different things. Within this story alone, you can pick up the tension that's between this woman and with Jesus. She's just baffled that he would even talk to her not just because she's a woman, but because she's also a Samarian, or sorry, Samaritan. Jews simply did not interact with Samaritans. The origin of this tension, it goes all the way back to the days right before Jeremiah. There was the ten tribes in the northern kingdom, and they had been totally ransacked by the Assyrian kingdom. They got wiped out. There was not a remnant. They did not return to the land. And so the people that were left there were the lower class people, the poor, the outcasts. And they sort of just assimilated with the cultures and with the peoples around them. They intermarried. And what they lost track of was the purity of the bloodline of being descendants of Jacob, of being people of God. And so the Samaritans, they went on into the 5th century to build their own temple. And they had this quasi-Jewish-looking religion. They had this quasi-Judaism, but it lacked this legitimacy. And then the Jews felt that especially reconstructing their own temple and all of this, they just despised the Samaritans, considered their temple and their worship to be pagan. They considered it to be a, a copy of the genuine and not real. There was this disdain. You mix that feeling in with their, their animosity and their prejudice towards their mixed ethnicity, and the goal was avoid Samaritans at all costs. So why did Jesus go that way? They would literally, you have, the, you have Jerusalem kind of on the east side of the, of the Jordan River, west side, and you could go straight up and get to Galilee if you went through Samaria, right? But you would have to cross the river and go up and around the Sea of Galilee to get to Galilee if you didn't want to go through Samaria. So there was a very deliberate action that Jesus was taking so as Jesus and this woman, they begin to converse, you see this progression. 
where the woman starts to recognize that this is, this is not a normal person. <laughs> and it wasn't just how he smelled. First, she interacts with Jesus like he's just any other Jewish man. He looks Jewish. He sounds Jewish. He's asking for a drink. Who does that? So if you still regard Jesus as just another normal, sweaty human being, it's pretty bizarre that he says, I'm going to give you living water. That strikes you as odd, does it not? And so I hear a little bit of sarcasm in her response, and maybe I'm reading that into it. It's kind of like, sure, give me the living water, and then I don't have to keep coming to the well. Like, win-win, I get to stop talking to this weird person, and I don't have to keep coming to the well in the middle of the day. And this is where it gets juicy. I think Jesus was Facebook stalking her. (laughs) That would be the modern equivalent. He gets a word of the Lord from the Spirit. We would call this a word of knowledge. He sees right through her past, and he says, okay, go get your husband. Like, zing! And it's a supernatural sign. There's no way Jesus would have known this woman's relationship status. But he goes on, and he lets her know that he knows all about how many times she's been married. She's had five husbands, and the man she's now with isn't her husband. So, yeah, he answered that correctly. Here she recognizes, okay, this is not just some random dude. He must be a prophet, So now, when you look at the next thing he says, it kind of strikes me as odd. Does it not sound like a redirect? Like, okay, he got a little too close, so let's redirect the prophet here, and let's talk about getting this attention off my sin and brokenness. And he says, if you're a prophet, what's the big deal about worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem? Why can't we just worship here on our mountain? And so he goes into this really interesting portrayal of the future of proper worship. This is one of these things that's still in development here at this point. He said, it's not going to be about temples and mountains. It's going to be about worshiping in truth and from the spirit flowing from inside. Kind of like, come on, my soul. There it is. Uh, Jen did not read my notes today, but boy, did that tie in. So thank you, Lord, for stirring that up in us. So here we see the spirit flowing from the inside is, is, is hinted at. It's just the first time we hear of that. And we got this Old Testament tradition, this theme, this understanding of living water, and it's really coming into its theological butterfly, to use the analogy. Access to the fountain of living water in the Old Testament was determined by the people of God living holy lives in the fear of the Lord. And this would involve following all of his commands regarding the temple, regarding worship. It was a very prescribed thing. Jesus flips it around rather than holy living in the fear of the Lord, securing their access to the fountain of living water. Jesus would become the fountain of living water from within them. And that living water would both quench their thirst here in this life and bubble them up all the way to eternal life. Now, if you're like the Samaritan woman, that's a lot to process. She says... This prophet is speaking things that I cannot wrap my head around. The only hope for making sense of this would be if the Messiah himself came and explained it to me. And then Jesus says to her, I am the Messiah. So let's look at this progression of how the woman was perceiving Jesus. You have a sweaty Jewish man. Why are you even talking to me? This living water stuff you're talking about is too good to be true, and it sounds pretty bizarre. Oh, you just read my mail. You must be a prophet. Only the, prof- the Messiah can make sense of what you're saying. Oh, you are the Messiah. Do you see that quick progression she goes through? She went from trying to live off of her own broken cisterns, right? All these broken relationships that can never satisfy, to becoming one of the first people to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah, She went from jaded and guarded and possibly sarcastic to joyful and free, and she's talking to everybody. I want to tell you this morning, Jesus wants to meet you at the well. Where have you been drawing water from, but it's just not satisfying? This is a perfect analogy. I keep thinking I won't get more thirsty. He wants to meet you at the well this morning. I think we can all agree on this. We are inherently thirsty. (laughs) Your physical body knows this well. You won't last more than a few days without drinking something. But more than our physical thirst, 
there's the seemingly unquenchable thirst for a sense of purpose, peace, and fulfillment in our lives. The people of Judah, remember them. They departed from the only thing that could really quench their thirst, the fountain of living water, and they exchanged it for something that was so empty and futile, mud puddles under the ground. The woman at the well, she had settled for the counterfeits. She had settled for the copies, the poor copies of something genuine. She was a Sumerian. What more could she expect? Have you ever had that thought? Yeah, I'm drinking from a mud puddle, but do you know my past? Do you know what's been done to me? If I can just get a little bit of fresh water from somewhere, I know it's not going to last. I'm just going to get through another day. Jesus offers you something so much better. What is your source this morning? What have you been drawing from? Whatever it is, if it is not believing in Jesus, the Messiah, and his spirit beginning to spring up in you like a fountain of living water, I can confidently tell you at some point it's going to crack and dry up. And it's simply not going to ever satisfy your soul. I'd invite you to stand this morning. To save some time today to do some work with God. As I mentioned, the direction that God has put on my heart is to talk about growing up in Christ. And for a lot of us, this is where we need to start. We need to start by recognizing where are we drawing from. What are the wells that we keep going back to but never leave us satisfied? What are the broken cisterns that we need to repent from and stop holding on to so that we can dive in to the fountain of living water? God has more for you. So as we take some time today, I want you to encounter God and take inventory of your life. He's taking us somewhere, and he wants you to be included in that. So one question you can ask yourself to help identify what you've been trying to draw from is, where are you seeking fulfillment? Are you seeking fulfillment in sin habits? Are you addicted to pornography? Is your life full of pride? Do you wrestle with emotional manipulation of those around you? Maybe it's busyness. Are you trying to keep everybody and everything happy and not letting you, yourself take enough time to let the good shepherd lead you beside the quiet waters and restore your soul? Maybe it's relationships. Are you putting expectations on others in your life to provide living water? And the only relationship that can do that is your relationship with Jesus. Maybe it's money and success. You're chasing after things that they simply will not last. It's a broken cistern. It cannot hold water. Church, we're going somewhere. We're growing somewhere. And I want you to get there with us. But before we get to where we're going, we need to check our source.